right, so we got the recording up and running. And we'll start up the browser. <coughs> So only in this classroom, you know, I did not, never had this problem in any of the other classrooms. So far, so good. All right. So, are there any questions about the homework assignment or anything like that? Yep. <coughs> um, so, on the one that receives two numbers, mm -hmm. it, we are going to receive a number, some number of spaces, mm -hmm. the second number. Right. And then there will be a new line character? At the end of each line that has two numbers, yes. So every line <coughs> has two numbers, and then there'll be at least one space between the two numbers on each line. Yeah. And then there will be you know, one line feed, you know, new line character at the end of each line to separate the lines. Yeah. It really should not matter if you use CN. You know, CN automatically skips uh, end of line as well as spaces. Yep. Wait, I thought scene had a delimiter at a space, at the first space, right? So how would you create the second one? Have you tried? Yeah. You have tried? Yeah. And what happened? What happened when you tried? It just got the first number. Okay. And then when you see it again, what does it do? I didn't do that. I just thought it would... You thought it would do what? I thought it would like to get to the new line if I see it. You, if you see in one more time into a, uh, mm -hmm. another variable, <laughs> it will skip the white spaces to read the second number. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. okay. We, don't, we don't have to search for the new line. No. Like, no. You just keep see see in. Um, let's see. That's uh, greater than greater than variable, and then see in greater than greater than a certain variable. See in automatically skips white spaces. When I say white spaces, they include the regular space character, the tab character, mm -hmm. line feed, form feed, you know, all of those are considered quote unquote white spaces. It goes until it hits whatever the input. Right. Is and it, like it gets an int, it goes until it hits a letter. Until it hits a digit. Yeah. Yeah. So it will read that, you know, number until it hits uh, white space again. On the other hand, if you have anything that is non digit, then it will well, it's not going to crash, but it will come back and say, okay, it is not parsable as a number. And it will get stuck from that point on. But you don't have to worry about that because the homework assignment says that the input is going to be valid. So I'm not going to throw you know, test cases at your programs. So the regarding input the format. It's just going to look like the two numbers or the one number, and then it's just going to have a new line. It's not going to be literally like what you would do with the new line on like C or C. Um, but in the file, it will still be the same. So you would have like 45, you know, 13 on one line. Okay. Okay. So there's an empty space between this. Yeah. And then at the end of this, you know, it was it will still have a line feed character. Mm -hmm. But you, like, C in can text. deal with it. Oh, okay. Yeah, C in can deal with all of this. If you just read number by number, so if you just say, okay, read the first number, read the second number, and then read the first number again, it will automatically skip the space and the line feed character. <clears throat> okay. So you just have to have that in a loop and spit out the answer. Exactly. Yeah. So in your loop, each iteration will read two numbers, and you have to check to make sure it is not in a file. So that's the the tricky part is you know how yeah. do you check in a file? That's, that's the loop, right? The loop is checking. Right. The well. the condition of the loop has to check for in a file, yeah. but inside the loop, you know, once you read two numbers, then you process those two numbers. And since I do not throw you know, exceptions, like you know, to try to trick your program, 
by you know, throwing in you know, like lines that only has one number or give you an odd number of numbers in the file. So you can always assume that every single time you, read, you try to read two numbers, it will be successful. Okay. Either, that, either it will be successful or you will hit end of file, you know, yeah. one or the other. Because yeah, I just wasn't sure if I needed to be checking the return character. No, you don't have to check for the return character. C in automatically deals with it. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No other questions? Yep, go ahead. The second program is doing the reverse. Yes. Yeah. yeah, one program is doing the F, which is going from 2D space to 1D space, and then the other one will flip it, which go from 1D space to 2D space. And we will assume that there's no, because you know, it can be an odd number of lines because one single number from the input turns into two numbers in the output. So the number of lines is irrelevant. It can be one line, can be two lines, can be even or odd number in terms of number of lines. But for each line, for the, for the second program, then you have to, the output would be a line that has two numbers. Yep, go ahead. Um, so the output for that one is going to be the coordinates? Yes. It will be the coordinates separated by a single space and a line view character at the end of each line. So it will look pretty much the same thing as the input of the first program. And that's why you can use the pipe to test the programs <laughs> by you know, you know, using a test, pro test file to feed the first program and then use the pipe symbol to take the output of the first program to feed it as the input of the second program. And then whatever the second program spits out should be the same as the original test file minus you know, the number of spaces between the numbers. Because you know, when, you, when you type it in, you can have like three spaces, three spaces in between. It will still be considered as one single space. But when you're outputting, you're, only, you're gonna only use one space. Okay, so are there any other questions about the homework assignment? Well, <coughs> mm -hmm. So I just heard you say that we need to be adding the new line on our output. Yes. So I'm just, you know, okay, so let's say you know, this number tra translates to, you know, some huge number. I'm just, you know, giving this yeah. as an example here. So let's say this, if this is the input, it will give you this output. Yeah. I can give you an input <laughs> file with only just one line of input like that. Then your output would be just one line of output like this. Okay. So if I, so this is the first program. This is a 2n1n, right? So if you take this file, okay, and pipe it to 1n, 2n again, the output of this program should be 45 space 13 again. Mm -hmm. Because it's the inverse function. You can also do it the other way around. You can start with 1n, 2n, pipe it through 2n, 1n, and then the output would still be the single same number that you used to test it to begin with. All right, any other questions about this program? Yep. Uh, one question I had about the nodes that I was reading was use the floor function for the for the or use the floor function and the regular function to uh, yes. test. Right, but at the very end you just use the floor function. Um, yeah. So can you explain why you did that? I don't really understand this. Because um, you said K I is equal to the floor function. Because without using the floor function, it's going to be a real number. Yeah, this, is, this can be an irrational number. And ki is supposed to be a nat natural number. You cannot, so that's why you, you use the floor function to turn it into a natural number. Wait, but if you use the floor, wait, so every single time you input an i, you'll get a natural number if you use the floor function. Because like when you use uh, i is equal to 7, you think you get like 3.3 or something. But yeah, because this part is a natural is, is not necessarily a natural number, mm -hmm. but k of i is supposed to be a natural number. Yeah. So you use a floor function to turn a real number, which can be irrational, into a natural number. You just round it down. Yeah. Not quite. But I explained that last time. Oh, okay. <coughs> so you, you can also look up you know, what is a floor function. Okay. And, yep, go ahead. Um, that one's mapping, you said 2D numbers, they're not, is it 2D rational numbers or 2D natural numbers? Too? We are only dealing with natural numbers. Okay. So when you apply, so I is supposed to be a natural number, so you're reversing a single natural number into a 2D number 
this is the first part of the natural number, okay. and then this is the second part of that coordinate. But they're both natural numbers by themselves. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions? All right. Well, at least we got the recorder up and running today. I actually have one more question. Yeah. Um, I got mine done, and it's accurate up to like, I tried like a 1,000, and it was accurate on 1,000, because I, I put one in the other one, and then like switched it again. Mm -hmm. But like if I just type in a bunch of random ones, like maybe 10 digits long, it wouldn't do that. Do you have any idea why that wouldn't hold? That could be right? a precision issue with uh, squares and stuff like that. Okay. So I'm guessing that that is probably what, what is, there is any happening. Way to fix it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. As long as the equation is consistent with what I have here, I'm just going to, what I would do is I'm going to generate the test cases based on the equation and based on you know, the usual way of implementing it using a double precision uh, square root function. So as long as yours is consistent with that, I will still be, I will consider that as correct. <coughs> it can also be out of bound. That's one of the problems is maybe it is out of bound too. Do you know what happens? You know, is it you okay? Just, you you probably won't. a different number than the original number. Okay. The there are several ways why it can happen because when you convert from two D into one D, um, you can it can get out of bound. Mm -hmm. So when it gets out of bound, C unlike or C and C plus plus unlike some other programming languages would not throw an exception. It doesn't tell you, okay, you know, we cannot store this number into a 64 bit or 32 bit integer. Mm -hmm. So you would take whatever is actually stored, which is the least significant part of whatever the actual number is supposed to be, and then you convert that back into a 2D number and it's not going to match because it is your, your 1D number is not really the actual 1D number. Yeah. So I, I, I'm <coughs> guessing that is what's happening. All right. so, so once it yeah. fills up, it just, it just stops adding right, the most because, significant numbers. Right, because in C and C++, the casting is automatic. You know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't give you a, an error message. So what, what I mean is, you know, if, let's say you have unsigned x, you know, which is an unsigned number, right? So unsigned, you know, de tip depending on whether you are using a 32-bit or 64-bit system, most people are using a 64-bit now, so this x would be a 64-bit number. But it's even the 64-bit number has a range, yeah. of, it has a limit. So when you do something like this, you know, x equals to um, you know, 1 e, say 100, okay? You know, that for sure is going to be out of the range. Um, this assignment statement may not cause a problem, okay? Especially if this is actually stored in a double first, and then you use the double variable on the right-hand side then the compiler cannot check. This may actually be detectable because it's a constant assignment and the compiler can just say, hey, whatever is on the left-hand side cannot store this you know, huge value. But when you store the huge value first into a double first and then you assign a double to an unsigned, there's no way the compiler can check that and say, hey, you know, this, this, you're out of range. But when this is happening in runtime, my guess is C++ does not throw an exception. If you're writing this in C, there's no exception anyway. So, you know, that's one of the problems. So one safe way to do, to check your homework assignment is to start with 1D, 2D. So you feed the 1D, 2D program, you know, anything, you know, any natural number that can be represented in 64-bit or 32-bit because the 2D number that it cranks out is always using components that are smaller. Yeah than the 1D number. So this way you, you won't run out of range. So you might want to try that, is to start with 1D, 2D, convert it into 2D, and then convert it back into a 1D number. So that way you won't be out of, you won't have the out of range issue. Okay, any other questions? No other questions? All righty. <clears throat> so if there are no more questions about this uh, topic, we are going to move on and talk about propositional logic. So I've been waiting to talk about this because this is a really kind of fun topic. Um, I just you know, recently found this uh, history of propositional logic. I'm not going to give you any questions in a quiz on this particular, you know, uh, on the history of propositional logic. But the bottom line is it started to exist in a very vague form 
uh, even in like th I think it's 300 BC or sometime like that, Aristotle yeah. was the first one to came up with an idea that resembles propositional logic. But it got refined over the centuries. So until the 19th century, it was still kind of like you know, kind of like cloudy and kind of vague. But now it is actually not vague anymore. Okay, so we are formalizing the system in this class so they can be processed by computers. Um, this is one part that where we just kind of quickly revisit um, operators in logic. Okay, so so I'm going to skip all the words and just jump right into the symbols. Okay, so this is conjunction. Okay, I'm hoping most of the class is now familiar with the uh, conjunction, disjunction, and negation symbols that we use in this class. And this notation here is really just a notation of saying that and ampersand, I mean uh, not ampersand, but the, uh, the wedge symbol is a function. It is a function that maps a domain into a codomain. In this case, the domain is the Cartesian product of 0, 1. 0 is false, 1 is true. So now we have this as our domain. The codomain is just true and or false and true. And the rest here, if you see this equal sign, it means that this is the exact definition of the function. And what it means is 0 and 0 is a 0. 0 and 1 is a 0. 1 and 0 is a 0. 1 and 1 is the only case where you end up with a 1. So that how, that's how you read, quote unquote, a function that is that we normally know as a logical operator. Yep? Um, revisiting basic logical operators is under the propositional logic topic. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I do the same thing with or and also negation. And negation looks a little, little bit different because negation is a is not a, uh, a binary operator; is a uni unary operator, which basically means it only takes one value, work on it, and then come up with another value. So are there any questions about this alternative way of defining the logical operators? Okay, so no you questions. Got a, a cross product matched to zero and one. Yeah, because you know this is gonna be the same with any type of uh, binary operator because the word binary operator means that it takes two operands, right? So if the operator took, takes two operands, that means that makes the domain the Cartesian product of the two kinds of values that you can take on. It's just a different way of looking at operators. Yep? Can you go over the negation? The negation? The negation here, basically, okay, this part is saying that negation is a function that maps from false true to false true. In other words, the domain is false true, and then codomain is also false true, which makes sense, right? And then this part here, you know, when you see the equal symbol, it means that this is the exact definition of the function itself. This means if you the, take the negation of not, I mean, uh, to, of false, it gives you a value of true. If you take the negation of true, it, if it gives you a value of false. Now, the way, the reason why I presented. Um, the operators in the, in, in, the, in the form of a function is kind of two-folded. One is to reinforce to make sure that we understand that you know, conjunction, disjunction, and negation, they're no more than just ways to map something from the domain in the codomain, okay? So that's the first purpose. The second purpose is really just to make sure that we understand what a function is, because I'm just casting an operator that we normally do not see as a function, as a function. So that's the purpose of you know, why I you know, presented this part. And then we talked about this already. Okay? You know, we have mentioned this several times already. Um, basically, when we say A implies B, it is really exactly the same thing as saying not A or B. Okay? So implies is really just an English word that we associate with the logical operator. It's just like we use the word and in a particular way in, you know, when we use it in natural language. It's the same thing. Implies is just one way of you know, connecting two concepts or two statements in this case, and it is equivalent to saying not A or B. Are we okay with that concept? Okay. If you're struggling with the word implies and saying, okay, but this is not how I see implies, 
then what you can do is to just to say, OK, this is by definition. OK, A implies B in mathematics, by definition, is not A or B. Just, you know, just say that it's by definition. Are we OK with that? OK. And then we have A is equivalent to B. OK, so A, if and only if B is also known as A is equivalent to B, which is basically you can redefine this using two implications. What it really is saying is A implies B and B implies A. But when you look at the truth table or the actual function definition, then you basically have you know, false is equivalent to false is true. True is equivalent to true is true. But for everything else, they're false. And that's why it is also known as if and only if. Yep? So using the previous definition of implication, wouldn't be equal to be not A or B and not B or A? Say again? So using the previous definition of A for implication, right? The, the previous way, definition yeah, of the implication. The one the not A or B? Uh-huh. So but this is not A implies B. Yeah, I know. But this would be that A implies B. Would that be not A or B and then and not that is true, yes. You can replace this part with not A or B. You can replace this part with not B or A. So how would that make them equal? Huh? So how would that make them equal to each other? Well, you can work out the truth table. So I will work this out once, but you can certainly do this on your own as well. Okay. So we have A, B, both being independent variables, which means we have false true for A, false true, false true for B. These are the four possible combinations between the values of A and the values of B. So we'll go not A or B first, okay? So when you look at not A or B, any, anywhere where A is false, the whole thing is going to be true because you have negation of A, not false is true, and then you have a or here. Once you have one side being true, the whole thing is true. So we know these two are true to begin with. This is the only row that has a false, and then the last one is true as well. Okay? Then you have not B or A, right? Where it's exactly the opposite. Any column and any row that has B being false, the whole thing is going to be true, right? So this is true and this is true. And any place where you have B being true but A being false, it is going to be false. And then the last one is true as well. So now you take the conjunction of these two, right? So you have not A or B and not B or A. So what do you get? One and one is one. One and zero is zero. Zero and one is zero. One and one oh. is one. Okay. So that's the nice thing about Boolean you know, logic is uh, for Boolean algebra is you can use truth table in most cases to prove equivalency. Because if the columns are exactly the same, then they are equivalent. Okay. Any other questions? No questions? All right. <clears throat> All right, so with, with this done, we are going to move on to the actual propositional calculus. And then you guys will say, but you said, you said there's no calculus in this class. Well, propositional calculus is not calculus in your calculus class. And that's because well, this is a part that I added just this morning because I just want to make sure that people do not misunderstand the word calculus to mean your usual calculus where you have <laughs> derivations, integrations, and stuff like that. So calculus is also used for naming methods of calculation or theories of computation. In this context, you can look at it either way. I mean, you can look at you know, uh, propositional calculus as a method of calculation except it's not calculating numerical values, it is calculating Boolean values, but it is still a calculation. Or if you prefer, you can also look at it as theory of computation. So both of those descriptions will fit the word calculus in propositional calculus. Just remember, it is not integration, it's not derivation, it is not continuous, okay? It's just a name to basically say, this is a formal mathematical system to deal with a certain type of uh, calculation. <clears throat> now it's kind of abstract. And you know anything that is abstract, you know, it's kind of difficult to understand to begin with, but I'll try my best to explain that. So a proposition can be anything that is that has a boolean value that is either true or false, okay? You know, this is actually not true. 
So proposition can be anything that is either true or false. And propositional calculus, any, pro any particular propositional calculus is a four tuple. And let me look at the, I have to find out what is the actual pronunciation. So this is just L, okay. So the uh, propositional calculus you know, system has four components. The first component is alpha. This is not A, this is the actual alpha. It has omega, it has zeta, and it has I I I iota, I think. Yeah, th this is iota. So it has four different sets as individual components of a, calcul of a proposition propositional calculus system. So there are these four components. So I'll do the explanation kind of first, and then we'll use an example. The alpha is really just a set of symbols to be used in the system. There are three particular types of symbols. One particular type of symbols are representing constants. In other words, these are things that cannot change over time. They are just, each symbol is representing a particular value, but it cannot change over time. Are we doing okay so far? So in regular mathematics, one, okay, the digit one, it's a constant, okay? Because every time you see the, the representation of one, it only has one single meaning. It is the quantity of one. So that's what a, a, a constant is. And then we have the concept of variables. So these are particular symbols that can take on any constant values. Okay? It really just kind of resembles what we know as variables in programming, okay? Um, because they can take on you know, any particular value. So you would think, okay, between constants and variables, that should cover everything. But then we have something called a schemata, okay? A schemata is associated with well-formed formulae. And I'll explain what a fo well-formed formula is later on. But basically, a schemata is not just a single variable. It can be an expression <laughs> involving variables and constants. So for now, you know, just for your convenience, just look at schemata as formula, expression, okay? Are there any questions at this point between constants, things that cannot change, variables that can take on any value, any constant value at any time, or schemata, which is basically just a fancy word for expressions? Any questions about these three? Okay, so typically, you know, in this class, I use zero, one to represent the constants. Zero means false, one means true. Okay, so we have been using that for a while already. Variables are represented by English alphabet letters. Okay, and typically people use PQRS and so on. Okay, for some reason they use it, they choose to start with PQRS, but there's no particular reason why some of the other letters cannot be used, and they're typically lowercase. Schemata, on the other hand, are used, we use uh, Greek symbols to represent schemata. Um, so pe pe people typically use psi, rho, and what is the other one, um, phi, you know, to represent uh, schemata. Okay, so moving on. Okay, this is basically, you know, alpha is just, you know, how do you spell things, okay? If you want to say, what is the actual meaning of alpha? Well, this is how we spell things. What are the basic components of spelling out things in propositional calculus? Now we move on to omega. Omega is known as connectives, okay? The elements, each element of omega is a connective, which is a fancy word of operator, okay? Conjunction is an operator. Disjunction is an operator. Negation is an operator. Implication is an operator. Equivalency is an operator. So all of the things that we just talked about earlier, those are all connectives. Okay, look at connectives as a fancy word of operators. Are we still doing okay so far with the terms? Yes? Uh, would it be going too far to say functions? Mm, we don't really use functions. Um, in propositional calculus, we only use uh, operators, but not functions. But I suppose you can look at those as functions. You can generalize as functions. It's just that you know, at this point, we don't usually you know, uh, look at that, look at it that way. But that would be fine as well. Okay. Any questions about um, between alpha and omega? 
alphas, the most basic components, you know, how do you spell words, and the omega basically are the connectives. Okay, they are to be they are the, the connections between the components in alpha. So it allows you to associate a variable with another variable. Okay, it turns it into an expression. Any questions between alpha and omega? The one thing that we, we don't have at this point is, okay, but what can you know, what what can an expression look like? Okay, because I said that um, schemata, a schemata is just an expression, but what can be in an expression? Are there rules as to you know how an expression can be formed? Because at this point there's nothing that I have said, right? In other words, at this point I can say a or and not b, is that an expression? Is it valid as an expression? Well, if you just look at alpha and omega, nothing says that it cannot be, right? So what do we do? Well, we have to look at you know, WFF, which is not WTF. So WFF stands for well-formed formula. And the rules are really kind of simple for you know, what can be seen as a well-formed formula. Each element by itself from the alpha set is by itself a well-formed formula. So what that means is, you know, let's say your alpha, you choose your alpha to consist of the constants 0, 1, P, Q, R to represent variables, and then you have a psi, rho, and phi. What's phi look like? Oh, okay, I'm going that. Okay, so let's say you choose this to be your alpha, okay? And then in your omega, you choose the usual operators, and or dot implies an equivalent to, okay? So now what we are saying is, if you take any element out of alpha, all by itself, it is already a well-formed formula. That's the smallest. It's the smallest unit of well-formed formula that you can make. Is that okay? All right. And then what we do is we construct things from the bottom up. So now it's basically saying for all i that is greater than or equal to 1, that is less than or equal to n, basically i is a natural number that is between 1 and n. And the first part here is saying that uh, phi i, phi subscript i is a well-formed formula. If you can guarantee that you have components, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, all the way up to phi n, and each one is a well-formed formula. And if you can also say that omega is in the set of omega n. Now, the omega n is basically saying this is an operator that takes n components. Then you can basically say you know, what you have just composed is also a well-formed formula. So you, this one is kind of looking at things from the function perspective. So you're basically saying, OK, can someone tell me what is in uh, omega 2 under this particular scene? Okay. What operators have, have required two operands? Pretty much all of them, except for negation. And negation will belong to which omega? Omega 1, because omega 1 is the set of all the connectives that only takes on one value. Okay. And let me just double check on omega and see if omega explains it. Yeah, I actually, it talks about it, I just kind of skip this part here. Omega subscript n refers to a subset of omega that comprises of all connectives that need n parameters. So the usual operator that we deal with would either be in omega 2, they're mostly in omega 2, but there's also omega 1, which only has negation. And there's no omega 3, that's a healthy oil. <laughs> in C and C++, there is omega 3. We know that as the ternary operator, yes. <clears throat> So are we still doing OK so far with all these con uh, concepts? Now, in this class, we are not going to use this notation. We, you know, we, since we only have omega 2 
So that means you know, instead of using the prefix notation where you indicate the operator first and then the operand, we'll just use the infix notation where we say you know, A and B as opposed to and in parentheses A, B. The equivalent is just that we are used to the infix notation more so than the prefix notation. It would be kind of fun to teach this class using the suffix notation once in a while, I guess. Did I talk about the suffix notation? No? Okay, maybe I should at least talk about it, just so that people know that there are alternatives to, um, I can do it on the, uh, on the projector here. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'll do is, what I'm doing is I am just illustrating another way to represent expressions. Okay, so there are many ways to um, express operators and which one should operate first. So I'm just going to give you the three different ways to do it. It is not directly related to this class, but it is related to your understanding of functions, expressions, and so on. <coughs> and at a later point of your career, you might actually find it useful too. Okay, so we'll start with infix. Okay, so we'll start with infix like you know a plus b, the whole thing times c, and then we'll say you know take this entire thing, divide it by d, and then we also have a x plus ahead of everything else. Okay. All right, so this is a typical. Uh, infix notation and expression using in the infix notation. So when you turn it into the prefix notation, you are basically spelling out the operation first, and then you tell the operation, okay, these are the things that you need to operate on. Okay. So if I turn this into the prefix notation, then I start with the last operation, which is the plus. What are we adding? Well, we're adding x, and then this whole bunch of stuff, you know, in the inside. So when you look at this whole bunch of stuff in the inside, which is the other part of the summation, the last operation is a division. Okay, so you say, okay, we're dividing something here. There's one big chunk of stuff here, but you know the um, denominator is d. So when you look at the numerator, the numerator itself is kind of complex, but the multiplication is the last thing that you do with the numerator. So you say, okay, this is a multiplication with some junk here, and then the second number for the multiplication is C. And then when you look at this part here, it is we're finally boiling down to A plus B. So A plus B is basically plus AB because we're spelling out what we want to do first, and then, okay, what are you doing it to with? Does that make any sense? You know, the infix, this is the prefix notation. Yep? We did this in data structures where we got rid of the uh, the parentheses? Well, so we ended up with plus A, B. Uh, you can also look at this as, you know, in a much more, you know, C-friendly matter. So you have a function that multiplies, and then you have another function that does the divide, right? And then you have another one that will do the multiplication, and then you have another one that will do the uh, summation, or I should say plus here. So it would be st it, this would be the same as the other one. So A, B, C, and then we have a D, and then we have um, X as the first parameter. Does not really matter because it's commutative. But this is this is the more C friendly way of looking at things. So if I have mult, divide, and plus as regular C and C plus plus functions, this is the same way to express what we know as the infix notation, which is up here. <coughs> so are there any questions between uh, about infix notation and prefix notation? Because these two are the things that we are quite familiar with. One is basically what we learned from you know, really early on, and then the other one is something that we learned when we write when we learn how to write functions in C and C++. So are there any questions about these two? Infix notation and prefix notation. Now one thing you might notice is with both infix and post and prefix notation, we have to rely on parentheses to indicate nesting or grouping or what to do first. Okay, what is the ordering of things to do? So when you look at this and go like, hmm, but I don't really have one to do with parentheses, there's a way to do it. It's called the suffix notation or the postfix notation. So the postfix notation is you basically keep a stack of things, okay? 
and then you, when you perform an operation, you're popping things out of the stack, you do the operation, and then whatever the result is, you push it back on the stack. So let's go ahead and see how this can be converted into um, the postfix notation. So in the postfix, postfix notation, this will turn into a x um, and then a b plus c times d divide. Okay, and then do a plus s d last one. Okay, this is it. You don't see any parentheses, and you can see how compact this form is. If it's not for the spaces to separate the items, the individual items, this would be a lot more compact than either the infix or the postfix notation or the prefix notation. Okay, the postfix notation is the most compact way of looking at things. But what does it mean? X A B plus C times D divided plus, you know, syntax error. Okay, <laughs> this is bad. Well, it's not too bad. Okay, so think about it this way. So we push X on the stack. And then we push A on the stack, and then we push B on the stack. So now we have three numbers on the stack. And then we do a plus. So what a plus would do is to do two pops, okay? So it's gonna pop B, it's gonna pop A, and then do an addition based on those two values. And then what it would do also is to push the sum of A and B back on the stack, okay? So at this point, okay, after the plus, at this point, we would have two values left on the stack. X is the first one, it is at the bottom of the stack, and then the top of the stack would be the sum of A and B. And then we push another number, which is C on the stack. And then we do the multiply. So the multiply is gonna pop two items from the stack again. So it's gonna pop C from the stack, it will also pop the sum of A and B from the stack. And then do the multiplication. The product is pushed back on the stack, okay? So now we have two values left on the stack again, which is X, and also the product of the sum of A and B and C. So are we doing okay so far? Okay. So then we don't do a single thing about that, we just push D on the stack. So after we push D on the stack, we now have three values on the stack, and then we do a division. So the division is gonna pop D, which we just push on the stack. It's also gonna push that big old product thing you know, from the stack as well, and then do a division. So by the time we're done with the division, then we would be left with the quotient of the division, and you know, X is also on the stack. We have exactly two items on the stack. So when we pop, when we do the plus here, it will pop those two items from the stack, perform the addition, and then push the sum back onto the stack. So at the end of this entire operation, there will be one single value left on the stack, which is the result of what we want. Are we okay with this? You don't have to be able to fully understand this part because I'm not gonna you know, give you any questions you know, to convert from infix notation to suffix notation. Um, but I just want to show you guys that there is an alternative, okay? And most people go like, well, theoretically speaking, maybe it is interesting, but does it have actual practical value? And the answer is yes. It has a lot of practical values, yes? Reminded me of how we did few registers, yeah. and then, but you also have the stack, which means yeah. you can do all the push and all the pops. Yeah. Yep. If you know, if you knew <laughs> postfix notation when you took assembly language, then you can take any infix notation and turn it into assembly code like just like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I got a little confused while you were going through this about which one was called which. I know the last one. Oh, okay. Stuff is posted. Yep. So this is the prefix notation. No, excuse me, this is the infix notation, which means the operator is in between. This is the prefix notation. They're both prefix, okay? It's just that one uses the operator. This one is kind of a lisp-like, okay? So I would say this is a lisp type prefix notation. And then this one here is more of a conventional C, C++, traditional programming language type of prefix. And then this one down here is the uh, postfix notation, which means the operator is specified last. Mm -hmm. The postfix notation, you know, by the way, is actually used a lot, okay? Um, when you buy a printer, you know, when you look at the specification of a printer, in the past, you know, all you see is PCL, you know, uh, printer control language compatible because that's a big HP standard. But these days when you go to, um, and buy a new printer, most printers will basically say they understand what? 
in, in, in addition to PCL, what do you think they understand? Starts with a P also? Post script. Post script, yes, post script. And do you know why post script is called post script? Because in post script, it uses post fix notation. notation, exactly. So you might think, okay, but why would a printer need to know post fix notation, okay? All it really needs to know is this pixel is white, that pixel is white, it's black, and so on and so forth. So why does it need to understand post fix? Because with a post script printer, you're not sending individual pixels to the printer. Because that would take up a lot of bandwidth to send you know, pixels to a 1200 DPI printer. Think about that, okay? For each square inch, you will have 1200 times 1200 individual zeros and ones. <clears throat> it's going to take a long time to transmit you know, all those you know, zeros and ones to the printer to make one page. So instead of doing that, you're sending commands over to the printer. You're basically saying, okay, I want this curve to start at this coordinate in inches or in whatever internal units that your printer understands, and I want the radius to be this much, I want the thickness to be this much, now draw that. And it's now device independent, because it doesn't matter whether your printer is 300 dpi or 1200 dpi, the, the command is exactly the same, because it's up to the printer to interpret that command and paint the pixels accordingly, okay? So PostScript is actually a full programming language. It's not really just, oh, I want to draw a pixel over here, draw a circle over there, draw a straight line over here. You, have, you can have loops, you can have functions. It's just a full programming language, for mostly for printers. And then most of you, or some of you, will say, yeah, but I'm not going to write anything in terms of printer drivers. I don't really care about that. Okay, fine. Do you use PDF? Portable document format. Yes, we all do, right? Okay, and you might think, okay, PDF is just another way. It's kind of like an HTML E kind of thing, you know, because uh, I can look at documents. Well, PDF is a lot more than that. If PDF is really just you know for displaying content that is completely static, Adobe would not be patching it all day long. You know, <laughs> I mean, how many times do you have to update your Acrobat Reader on a per week basis? <laughs> Once a week at least, right? So why do you need security patch when something is only there to display an image? That's not what PDF is. Mm -hmm. PDF, once again, is a full programming language. Who came up with uh, PDF? Adobe, right? Who came up with PostScript? PostScript. Well, I think Adobe licenses it from the other company, but you know, Adobe definitely has something to do with PostScript. So these two are related. Inside PDF documents is actually a whole bunch of post script or post fix notation stuff. It is completely programmable, and that's why it can potentially has a lot of security flaws, because it is every single PDF document is a program. When does it run? As soon as you double click it. When you, when you open a PDF document using Acrobat Reader, or whatever reader you want to use, it is actually running the script inside the PDF document. So the postfix notation, you know, is interesting in many ways, but it is also practical. Why do you think they chose to use postfix notation instead of the more common infix or prefix notation? Faster. It's much faster to parse. Okay, and you cannot have, uh, you don't need um, the parser is a lot simpler because you don't have to deal with the infix notation. You don't need to understand parentheses. It's just a matter of push, 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 pop, 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 calculate, push again, and then push again, pop, 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 and so on, okay? So it's a lot easier to implement from the perspective of a program. If you are a computer, this is the easiest to parse. This is the second easiest, because it still has a fairly simple you know, syntax, but this is nasty from the perspective of a human, because there are so many parentheses to match. This, on the other hand, is what we are used to, so that's, that's basically the, the quick rundown of the three ways to express <coughs> expressions. All right, so that's a little digression from what we are talking about. But in this class, when we talk about well-formed formula, we are using the infix notation, unless otherwise you know, specified. So here's an example, okay? This is a fairly typical you know, example. 
where I use um, phi. Oh, no, this is a uh, this is phi. This is psi. This is rho. And then we have the lowercase p, q, r, s, t, u as variables. And then we have zeros and ones, zero and one as constants. So this will be the set A or alpha because it gives us all the basic building blocks of expressions and whatnot. <clears throat> we have two omegas because we have omega one being just the negation itself. And then we have omega two with our conjunction, disjunction, implication, and the equivalent to. <clears throat> operators. So this is a fairly typical thing. So now we can say since we choose to use the infix notation, so now we can say that you know n p q, which is also the same thing as p n q, it's also a well a well formed formula because we are supplying exactly two things to an operator that requires two things, and each thing that we're supplying is by itself a well formed formula because everything in alpha is by itself a well-formed formula to begin with. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So the rule that makes something a well-formed formula would also say that the following is not well-formed. Okay. If you just say and p, that is not well-formed because the and is from omega 2, it requires two operands, and that we're only giving it one, so that makes and p by itself a not, it is not a well-formed formula. <coughs> is that okay? But you can also have something like this, p and p, even though it is not particularly meaningful, is well-formed. If you use it as a component to something that requires only one value, it is well-formed. Are we doing okay so far? Because this is basically just the syntax of what is considered well-formed. What, what about the meaning? What about the meaning of this? Okay, let, let's make this even more meaningless. Okay, let's look at something like this. Okay, is it well formed? Does each operator or connective has the right number of values so it can op operate on? It does, right? Negation needs one, conjunction needs two, and then negation only needs one. But is this expression? interesting at all? Does it give you something that is, well, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false? Or does it always give you something, a particular value, all the time? It's always true. It's always true, but how do you know this is always true? Because the middle is always false. Ah, but how do you know not it's false. always false? How do you know P and not P is always false? How do you know negation means you know, if you have a zero, it becomes a one. If you have a one, it becomes a zero. At this point, when you look at just alpha and omega, and even the definition of what is a well-formed formula, nothing tells you about the semantics or the meanings of the connectives, or even the constant. Zero is just a constant. We don't know what it means. It's just a symbol. One is just a constant, but it's, once again, it's just a symbol. We don't know what it means. Zero, at this point, does not mean false in any way. One does not mean true in any way. It's, those are just you know, symbols. Okay, so the meaning of everything comes from iota, okay, or uppercase i. Iota is a set of expressions or well-formed formulae that is known to be true. Don't ask me why it is, okay? So let's take a look at you know, what is typically in iota. One is by definition true. Not zero is by definition true, and then we can have a whole bunch of stuff here, but most of those are not actually required. Okay, so but we do need these. Okay, we need to know that zero and zero, or the negation of that, is true, because that means zero and zero is false. So instead of saying what is false, we we are forced to say what is true. So for anything mm -hmm. that is false, you have to put a negation around it, and then put it into iota. Are we doing okay so far with these definitions? So iota is what gives meanings to the connectives and the constants. Without iota, one has no meaning, zero has no meaning. Even though we can have well-formed formulae without iota, we wouldn't know what to do with the well-formed formula. We would, not, we would not know how to evaluate 
the well-formed formula, but iota gives us the meaning or the semantics so that we can actually evaluate the uh, uh, well-formed formula. Are we doing okay so far with this? Do you want me to give you an example as to why iota is important? Okay. So I would just say that you know we can make we can make names okay, out of nouns. I mean out of uh, um, vowels and consonants. Okay. So I'm just going to pick a subset of everything. So in consonants, we have K, we have PH, uh, we have R, we have L. Okay, so these are the you know, um, consonants that we can pick. And then for the vowels, we'll pick um, uh, short I, um, U, and short A, okay? So, yep? I was just gonna ask, is, is I ever kind of definitional? Yes, it is. It is axiomatic, which means you know, don't ask me why, this is the way it is. So when, if you want to make your this, propositional. These are, these are the pro this is what we're working with as far as the defined. Uh, this is, this is true. Typically, you want your iota to match the operators that we are used to so that your propositional calculus system ends up being useful. But you can certainly define it to be some really oddball thing that does not match you know, how we use those symbols for. Is, is that OK? Because all of this stuff here is being fed into an engine. And then the purpose of the engine is to say, OK, starting with you know, certain known things, I can derive you know, um, the, the theorems. I can prove theorems to be true or false based on you know, simple propositions. Is that? Making any sense? Okay. okay. So alpha is basically the same thing as saying, okay, these are the things that we can have in terms of pronunciation. Well, actually, I take it back. Well, let's do it this way. And then omega is basically just saying, okay, what kind of words can we use to connect concepts? Okay. Um, we can say, you know, um, they're acting symbols. Okay. So I'm going to use a single right arrow to mean acting on something. Um, and etc. Okay, so now we can have well-formed formulae and basically say you know, you know, poor you know, real you know, points to real and so on and so forth. Does it mean anything to you? Nope. Doesn't mean a single thing because I haven't told you anything about what this symbol means, right? So I can make things, I can make, I can make sentences up, but those sentences would be meaningless because we have not defined the meanings of stuff. So that's why iota is important because it is the one set that gives meaning to both constants and your connectives, operators basically. So you will have to encapsulate everything that you know about the truth tables of all the operators into iota, as well as you know, everything that you know about the constants into iota. Are we OK so far with this stuff here? Okay. The, the purpose and the importance of each set. Alpha, just the basic stuff, how do we spell? Okay. Um, omega is how do we connect things. And then iota is what are the meanings of stuff. Okay. If I use these terms in a real math class, you know, I think the department will probably uh, have a problem with me. Stuff, you know. So now we have more stuff. We have, you know, we have the last component of a propositional logic system. And this one is the most interesting part, okay? Because it allows transformation, it allows derivations or inference, you know, to be exact using those terms. The zeta class, the zeta set, is made up of rules where you can see, say, hey, given this, then this, and this, and this, hey, we can say that. It's inference, okay? It's inference. Um, so each rule or each element in zeta has the form of this. Okay, this is the, the shape of one element in zeta. So when we take a closer look, okay, it consists of you know some well-formed formula or well-formed formulae known as in this case 
uh, psi 1, psi 2, and so on. And then this really kind of awkward symbol, kind of like a T rotated counterclockwise 90 degrees, is inverse. Okay, so look at this symbol and say inverse. And this is the result of the inference. Okay, so if you can confirm these things, then you can infer this. Now, is inferring the same thing as implying? They are related, but they are not exactly the same thing. So we'll talk about you know, what the, act, the exact relationship between those two. Probably not today, probably on, uh, on Wednesday. Okay. So what this means, okay, when you see this particular symbol, and remember, um, psi 1, psi 2, those are all schematas, which means psi 1 by itself is just a well-formed formula but it can be very complicated. Okay? So what this means is if you can confirm that psi 1, psi 2, and so on are either in iota, which means they're by definition there, or the results of other transformations, then quote unquote z, then um, phi follows. Okay? Or this is also called a consequent, or as a result, you know, phi is also true. This is where the fun begins because this is how we can infer stuff. So we'll go take a look at some of the uh, inference rules. Okay. This is an interesting inference rule. What it says is even if you know nothing, okay, given that you know nothing, you can say that you know, any well-formed formula or the negation of that well-formed formula is true. <laughs> And you might say, how can that be useful? <laughs> Sometimes it is actually useful. Okay? <clears throat> and then the next one is kind of the uh, inverted form of this one. Starting with absolutely nothing, you can say the negation of phi and not phi, not the uh, psi and not psi, is true. Well, once again, it's not particularly helpful because it'll, it holds true for any uh, well-formed formula uh, psi. And then this one is basically just saying that if you know that for some well-formed formula phi and well for some well-formed formula psi, phi implies psi. That's one thing that you know. And then you also know that phi itself is true. Then you can infer that psi is also true. But this, is, this has nothing to do with actual meaning. This is transformation. This is syntactical transformation. It simply says, if you see this well-formed formula, and then you see the same component inside another well-formed formula in an implication, then you can look at these two and say, oh, OK, we can now infer this is also true. This is also in the system on its own. That's all it's saying, OK? It is transformational. It is syntactical transformation. It's mechanical. It has no meaning associated with it whatsoever. Okay. The next one is kind of the same thing, except it's flipped backwards. So in this case, if you have an implication, if you have a well-formed formula that by itself is an implication, it has two components. If the first component is phi, and then the second component is psi, and on top of that, you also have another well-formed formula where it is a negation of this component um, psi here. If you have both of these well-formed formula in the system <coughs> sitting somewhere, then you can say the negation of phi is also true. Or the negation of phi you know, as a well-formed formula should also exist. It's also true. It's a transformation rule, okay? But it does, quote unquote, it does make sense. We'll talk about what makes sense you know, a little bit later. Yep. Is that saying the negation um, is true or that it exists? It's true. You know, anything that exists in the system, you know, is true. Yeah. So basically, you're starting out with something that is known to be true, and then what you're trying to do is to work your, your work work your way to. Um, the theorem that you're trying to prove. Okay, so this one is really obvious. 
if you can find a well-formed formula phi and you find another well-formed formula psi, then the conjunction of those two is true. Well, because they're individually true, right? If they're individually true, then the conjunction is true. It's not really surprising. And then on this, this is the interesting one. This is a simplification, which basically means if you find a single well-formed formula where it is a conjunction, and then the components of the conjunction has um, phi and psi in it, then you can say, hey, I also know that this by itself is true. And you can say the same thing about the other one. Right? Yes, yes, correct. But you can use another one to uh, deal with uh, commuta commuta uh, commutative operations, so you can just flip the order. But each one is nothing more than a syntactical rule to basically say, if you spot this in existence, then you can also say that this can exist by itself. Are we doing okay so far with all this stuff here? Sort of, okay. <clears throat> and some transformations can go both ways. So when you look at this particular symbol here, it is basically saying, okay, it goes in one way, but it also goes the opposite direction. So in this case, we have, this is kind of the definition of implication. So uh, phi implies psi is exactly the same thing as not phi or psi, okay? We talked about it a little bit earlier in class, but in this case, you know, we can say one infers the other and, and also the other way around. So we have a whole bunch of transformation rules like these, and the point is we want to be able to uh, specify enough transformation rules, define the semantics and stuff like that, so that we can put all of this stuff inside the computer and tell the computer what is true to begin with, and then have the computer to prove theorems for us. Okay. And this is um, this type of propositional logic is not present you know, back in the times of uh, Aristotle, okay, because he has he has no computers. He doesn't have a cell phone, he has no apps. Right? So he only talks about things, he, he talk he thinks about how to argue, he thinks about you know how do you convince other people, how do you use logic. When you, you, you when you try to you know argue or figure out things, but he doesn't he has no interest in making things mechanical so that you can do it with a computer. But we do. Okay. All right. So this go, kind of goes on and on and on. Okay. So now we talk about soundness and completeness. So are there any questions before we move on to soundness and completeness? Any questions about this stuff here? This is all transformational, okay? That's all it does, is transformational. Is that okay? All right, okay. So the significance of this stuff here is because you know, we want to use these really mechanical synthetic transformation to prove theorems, which is not usually a very mechanical process. So does anyone you know, consider you know, the proofing of theorems in calculus or linear algebra to be, ah, that's just a mechanical stuff? Uh, no. It depends on the subject, because if you do, there are theorems that you can do computationally. And there's a famous book called A equals B that's about, it's about a certain combinatorial formula that gives it a way that you can uh, create computationally, show, prove a bunch of uh, Formulas using the WZ method, as it's called, called uh, and you, it also produces these six certificates so that you can actually double check the, that that formula is correct on your own. Okay, but when you apply these rules in your classes that requires you know you to prove stuff, do you think the the process of proving something being is it mechanical? Is it like just chore? Is it something that you can do while you're watching TV? Usually not, yeah. because it is not mechanical. Anything that's really mechanical, we can usually do it you know, while distracted. We can multitask a little bit. But if it's not you know, mechanical, then we cannot. So, but we are trying to make things mechanical. And you look at all of these things here and go like, well, each one is kind of mechanical, but this also means the system can go haywire and just keep deriving stuff that is meaningless and useless. So we won't actually get to the result that we want. or 
the rules that we have here as transformation rules, you know, the, these inference rules, may not represent the logic that we want to deal with properly. Okay, so there are two things that can make this whole system pointless. Yep. Are those the same as the axioms? You mean the transformation rules? Yeah. They look really similar. They are. The transformation rules is allows you to do inference, to infer something. So they're axiomatic in the way that they are by definition, you know, we don't question why, okay? But there is a check there's there's a way to check whether it makes sense or not. Okay, so that's what we are gonna do next. Okay. But you're correct that they are by definition, but the question is, are those definitions is it meaningful? Does it make sense? They remind okay? me of identities. Identities? Mm -hmm. Where it's the same thing, just looks different. Sort of. Okay. So, I don't. Ha I won't have enough time today to really kind of dig into soundness and completeness. One is basically saying, okay, given a particular um, logic system that you want to deal with. Okay, let me take, take it back. Soundness is whether the propositional logic system is sound or not which basically means you know, does it match what you really want to do. Because I can specify the wrong transformation rule, okay, and then the theorem they can prove has nothing to do with reality. It is not quote unquote incorrect, it is just inconsistent with general logic. So if I make the transformation rules or the inference rules so that it does not match reality, so the result of the transformation is useless, that will make it not sound. Okay, so soundness basically means um, is the result of the inference is it useful? Okay, just you know, without you know, looking into those other terms that I cannot explain today because of lack of time, it simply means you know is it useful? Okay, let's say it's useful. The next question is is it complete? In other words, if you can solve, if you can prove a theorem by hand, okay, and just go like okay, I can do this by hand. But the next question is, can the system also prove it using these inference rules? If it can, it is complete. If it cannot, it is incomplete. Okay? Okay, so if you want to take a really kind of short and very non-mathematical description of these things, soundness means, can it get the job done? Okay. Is it correct? Okay. Can it get the job done correctly? Completeness is, can it get all the jobs done? Because you can have a system that is correct, but it is incomplete, which means it can get some jobs done, or whatever it can get done is correct, but there are things that it cannot do. Sound and completeness means, you know, can it get all of everything done correctly? Can it get all of everything done? So that's completeness. But completeness does not imply soundness because complete can still say, okay, we will do everything that you want me to do correctly, but then I'll do something else that is incorrect. Okay, so that's just kind of the, the short version of these two terms. The long version of these two terms is going to be defined in terms of semantic entailment and also the other one, which is syntactic entailment. Okay. But what you need to do is to keep in mind that when we talk about syntactic stuff, okay, when we talk about semantic, it is the actual meaning of stuff. When you talk when we talk about syntactic stuff, it is the mechanical aspect of it. So syntactic stuff is what the computer does, semantic stuff is what we do. So we want it to be a match because we want every theorem that I can prove by hand to be provable by the system. That's completeness. We also want all the results that the computer can prove to be correct so that I would come to the same conclusion. That is soundness. So kind of keep that in mind as you read all this stuff here because it's easy to get lost in the details. So when you read the notes, you, know, you have to kind of keep in mind, okay, what am I reading? Why am I reading this? How do these you know, concepts relate? All right. So we are out of time today, but good thing to, the good thing is we have recording today, so I will upload it later, and you guys can listen to it if you need to. Chat? Yep.